Okay, well, we will go ahead and get started then. Obviously, I think everybody here knows me. Uh, some people online may not know me, <laughs> but um, we'll just go through. And my name is Scott Mauser. Obviously, I'm with Alpha Omega Institute. Um, I've handed you two handouts. One of them is actually the complete outline because I make a ton of references to different authors, to different quotes. And so sometimes what I'll do is I actually will take just a section of the quote. And so that people don't think that I'm proof texting, you can actually go in and see the entire quote. And then also I give reference to where the quote is found. So if you wanna go and you wanna check my sources, please do, um, you can go through that. So the paper that you have, and if anybody's watching on Facebook Live or um, through Zoom that actually uh, would like to email or have a copy of this email to you, just contact us and we'll get this sent out to you. The first one you have in your hand is called testimonial. This is so you do not have to take any notes. All you have to do is listen and to kind of process the ideas. Uh, because this truly, if you don't wanna think this is gonna probably make your head hurt, because I, I do give you a lot of information. We talk a lot about abstract concepts, things of that nature. But I also want you to have this so that you can take it back with you, so that you can make reference and see and kind of refresh your mind. The other one is actually kind of an outline of some takeaways. And with these takeaways, uh, essentials to remember, questions that all worldviews have to answer. And then it also goes into a couple of the most popular arguments for theism or the existence of God. Hey, Nalene. And so when we look at that, um, there's also some book references. Uh, if you are interested in identifying um, or examining the Christian faith. And then there's also, Brian has uh, several places that you can go uh, that are links that'll actually take you uh, to some places with science, things of that nature. So the first thing I wanna do, if you do not have a handout, you should. I wanna have you just go to the first page of the testimonial. Okay. And really, it's a testimonial, but it's not. It's more an apologetic uh, that's kind of contained in my life. And so the framework is the experiences I went through. So if you can see on the screen, I have two chairs and I have one, uh, which is a glass uh, or a stained glass of what is called Christ Pentecrator, which is Christ in victory. And the other one is what? Anyone take a guess? Flying Spaghetti Monster. <laughs> Actually, there's a stained glass window of the flying spaghetti monster. So there are actually atheist churches, too. I don't know if you guys are aware of that. Um, but anyways, so why don't we go through it? And this will just get you at the beginning, and then the notes will go through. It says, why the two chairs? <clears throat> As Francis Schaeffer would talk about, Francis Schaeffer was a gentleman that went over to Europe during or right after World War II. And he was, a, he was a missionary, he was a pastor, he was a theologian. And he was going over there to help Europe kind of rebuild, help some of the cultural parts. He started a place called Le Brie, which in French means the shelter. This is a place that if you had serious questions, you could go to and he would talk to you as long as you were serious about anything. He had parts of the Manson family that came and visited him. He had heads of state. Date. He had other things. And as long as you had questions, he would answer them for you. And so he used to say, you need to sit in the chair. And that's why we have the two chairs. <coughs> Excuse me. You need to sit in the chair of those you disagree with and assume their assumptions and see what their conclusions ultimately will be. And then you ask, does it fit our world as we know it? So I went from Christianity to primarily atheism, a couple of other stops along the way, um, and back again. So what I'm going to present to you is actually a logical argument, the way that I frame it. Okay, It's traditionally called an argumentum or a reductio ad absurdum. And basically, you argue a position, you assume the assumptions, and then you take it to its logical conclusion, and you see whether it comes to absurd conclusions. Okay. Basically, instead of working this out mentally or abstractly or within my mind, I actually lived it out, unfortunately. Okay. So to a certain degree, it was lived out instead of thinking through it. And so I want to get you to think today. I want to help you to see the errors I made in my thinking as I confronted obstacles 
skills in evaluating life and hopefully help you to remove the obstacles before they have the same effect that they had on me, okay? Um, questioning is good if you're truly seeking answers. Um, I'm a Christian, do not fear questions. I wanna know what's true about reality and if wrong, I wanna know it. And raising my kids, I always said, if you ever find out that Christianity is not true, by all means, don't believe it because you don't wanna end your life knowing that you lived a lie, okay? So um, I think if you seek truth, and we're gonna discuss what I mean by truth because it's misunderstood in a lot of ways, I'm confident you will end up with the intellectual assurance of Christianity's truth. Will you have every question answered? Obviously, no, okay? But will you have enough to be able to stand on the position and say that you believe this is true to reality, and you will? Um, you'll have enough answers and a preponderance of evidence that will show it to outperform any other competing worldview in explaining reality as we know it to be. But that does not mean that you will become a Christian. You will see that many people deny its truth for other non-rational reasons. So basically, this is uh, kind of it's framed in my life. Um, but it's more of the thought processes. It's more of the comparing of the two chairs. And so atheism was primarily the worldview that I basically was attracted to because of my background in science. So a couple of housekeeping items really quick just to get through. And one thing that's also good, I've had the opportunity, I'm able to teach this in high schools. I usually get about 120 kids that I get to teach at Grand Junction High School for about an hour and a half. And uh, usually in four different classes of about 30. So it's a great opportunity. But a couple of housekeeping items. First thing I wanna talk about is what I mean by truth. We're in a day and age where really uh, truth is considered relative. Uh, in 2016, Oxford came out with its word for the year and it was post-truth and it said, relating to or denoting circumstances in which objective facts are less influential in shaping public opinion than appeals to emotion and personal belief. So really we're at a time that facts don't matter as much. We hear things like, well, it may be true for you, but it's not true for me. And we're gonna kind of examine that because that's not the truth I'm talking about. I'm not talking about truth as if it's an opinion. I'll give you an example. Okay, this is one of my favorite philosophers. His name is Soren Kierkegaard. This actually comes from his works of love. Okay? He was in the beginning of the 1800s, didn't live a real long life, but most of the time when I show this, I haven't had a Dutch person yet, or they can read this. Okay? So obviously, if you can't read it, you need some way of understanding. Because basically, when it comes to that, when an author is writing, he is trying to convey an idea to you. Now, ironically, for those who are in English or maybe are in critical theory, you're going to come across this guy. His name is Jacques Derrida. He was a um, French philosopher. He was part of the, the author is dead movement, meaning that it was no longer up to the author. It wasn't authorial intent. It was basically only up to the person who was reading it. They had to give it meaning. The only problem is, is it's a little contradictory because Jacques Derrida, when he wrote his books, I'm sure he intended you to understand him as he meant to not to make your own. So we're gonna see that a lot of worldviews actually contradict themselves. In philosophy, it's called the, the law of coherence. And if something is co incoherent, meaning it contradicts itself, it can't live up to its own standard, it's necessarily false. But most people are probably never gonna get into his, but basically we're trying to get ideas across. And so we decide we don't know Dutch, so we decide to go to Google. Google Translate has a glitch that day. We didn't realize it. So we put in our Dutch quotation. It comes out with this. The universe we observe has no design, no purpose, no evil and no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither cares or ne neither knows nor cares. DNA just is and we dance to its music. Now, if you're a little astute, you would say, well, if Soren Kierkegaard was writing in the 1800s, we had no idea what DNA was. Okay, but maybe you're not. But again, that's why it is so important for us to understand that truth exists and there are messages, intentional messages, intentional things, facts actually ma matter more than opinion and belief. This is truly what the quote says. Indeed, one.
can be deceived in many ways. One can be deceived in believing what is untrue, but on the other hand, one is also deceived in not believing what is true, okay? Truth is not what a lot of us have been told it is. It's not personal in the sense of we can change things. And I think a lot of the times when it comes to Christianity, most of my time is spent actually deconstructing what people think Christianity is. Um, one of our speakers was giving a lecture and an atheist stood up in the crowd and to the chagrin of the other atheists because they knew that this gentleman was wrong. But he said, I can never believe in a book that says that the universe is flat or the, you know, the, uh, the earth is flat and it's floating on the back of a tortoise. And our speaker said, well, yeah, uh, I wouldn't believe that either. But it's ironic how many people believe things about Christianity that aren't true. Um, a lot of the times when I talk to people, I try to tell them, I said, you need to find out if you're always looking at how people practice a faith, you're never truly necessarily going to know what that, fee, what that faith teaches. I said, because we're all hypocrites. We all have problems. We all fail in what we're trying to do. That if you're ever going to evaluate a worldview or a faith, you need to know from its most prominent advocates that are well-respected within that community what they believe, but what they teach, and what, they, what the, the faith itself teaches. And so this is the kind of true that I am talking about. It's interesting. She's a millennial, and she was writing to millennials, and she was trying to get people to reconsider the scriptures. And one of the things that she said is, what worries us is how easily we can be fooled into accepting as truth something we like to hear, but in reality is harmful, while rejecting what sounds uncomfortable, but is really for our good. Makes me think of things like insulin, because if we had somebody that went to a doctor and found out that they were type 1 diabetic, and they said, you know what? That's true for the doctor, but you know, in all honesty, I think what I need is ice cream. I think ice cream will do it for me. What's going to happen? Whether that person believes or not is irrelevant. What basically is going to happen is they're going to die because there are facts to life that are undeniable. This is the kind of truth, again, that I'm talking about. Gravity. You know, it's so interesting, I think, because what people do is the world around us has laws. It has mathematical equations that can explain it. But all of a sudden, when we get into the immaterial realm, everybody thinks that it's a smorgasbord, that we can pick and choose what we want, yet all of reality as we know it has very definitive laws, parameters, things of that nature. If we saw a line of people that were jumping over a cliff, hopefully one of us or somebody would put up a sign, go talk to them and say, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe, that you think you can fly, whatever may be the case. It's not true to reality. Okay, so we really need to find out what is true. And this is kind of a precursor for what I was going through. I don't know if you guys are familiar with this gentleman, Felix Baumgartner. Anybody here like to skydive or want to skydive? No? Well, this guy jumped from 128,000 feet. He actually was the first person in free fall to actually break the sound barrier. He ended up going over 900 miles an hour. Okay, so. When you think about this, I like to put forth this as an analogy because when he is up there, he's testing out a spacesuit for SpaceX and NASA. He has to be basically working with many people who are engineers uh, that deal with psychology in the sense of what kind of pressures that this is going to exert on him, maybe mentally, stress, things of that nature. You're also going to have to have fail safes that you're going to put in because actually in his free fall, you hear him because if you know anything about skydiving, to be able to stabilize yourself, you put out your hands so that you can get friction and you can stabilize. Well, when you're in the stratosphere, there's not enough. So he actually went into a spin where he's talking back to the people on the ground and he says, I'm gonna pass out, I'm gonna pass out, I'm gonna pass out. And if he passes out, obviously he's dead, unless there's fail safes. And so when we look at this, I like to give it, it's the analogy of life. What is true, just as he had to take many things into account, he had to trust people, he had to find out what's true about physics, he had to find out what was true about the world that he lived in so that he could successfully land at the bottom without dying. So are we prepared for the ride as well as the arrival or departure? If Christianity is true, 
there are certain consequences. If atheism is true, there are certain consequences. So we look into those. Last thing I wanna talk about is this idea of confidence versus arrogance. It seems like nowadays, if you talk confidently about anything, people call you arrogant, okay? And I just wanna kind of make sure that this is at the forefront of our mind as we go through this, because you can have confidence. Two plus two equals four. We know water is H2O. We know E equals MC squared. There's other scientific laws, theorems, things of that nature. We can be very confident about. They've been tested, tried. We also can know things forensically about history. We can know things for sure. But all of a sudden, when it comes again to the religious sphere, we think that everything is up in the air, that we don't have to match it to reality. We can pick and choose. If I come off as arrogant, I'm sorry. Uh, my son, my wife, and many other people say that when I get really passionate about something, I can get pretty intense. And so if that happens, the one thing I hope you're asking is what's the evidence? Because in a world of relative truth, I hope you fight ideas and not people, okay? I always find it when people start attacking me, that's usually the end of their arguments. They have nothing else to present. It actually shows basically that <clears throat> either they haven't thought about it or they're finding something that they can't contradict or they can't prove wrong, okay? It's interesting, Christopher Hitchens, one of the most well-known atheists, um, God is not great. Unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago from pancreatic cancer. Um, but he said, I have been called arrogant myself in my time and hope to earn the title again. But to claim that I am privy to the secrets of the universe and its creator, that's beyond my conceit. So a lot of the times people who believe in religious truths are confident of what they believe is true to reality, are automatically com considered conceited and arrogant. So from the get go, I want people to understand that we need to fight ideas. We need to evaluate ideas. We need to argue ideas and not base them in how we think, but what is true to reality, okay? So this kind of gets into the point now, the, the reductio part of the argument. So basically I frame it in my life because I went from Christianity to atheism back to Christianity. And so basically it truly was a conflict for me when I, and this really started in middle school for me. Uh, my sister is a chemical engineer. My older sister uh, actually is a sociologist and French literature major. She actually went to uh, France uh, for a time being in Paris. And so she would give me a lot of different books, uh, books that she was familiar with, things of that nature. But it also came down to what I was being taught in school. And basically I started to think that maybe what I believed was not true reality, it was a lie. And I wanna make sure that people know asking questions is a good thing. But what happened to me is that I went to people that I thought should be in the know. I went to elders in my church. I went to my pastor. I went to people that I thought would have the ability to answer this. Nobody could answer the questions. So when nobody can answer the questions, what do you usually think? There aren't any answers, okay? So basically for me, it truly was science and religion. In the Bible, I read God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, through school, I was learning evolutionary theory and big bang cosmology. Um, the pivotal point to my faith was Jesus Christ dying and raising from the dead, okay? But dead men, according to science, do not come back, okay? I believed in the beginning were Adam and Eve. There were two people that all the human race came from. But according to Darwinism and evolutionary thought, everything was chance, accident, mutation, natural selection. There was no rhyme or reason. Okay? And so when I put this together, I could see an obvious conflict. I didn't know the law of non-contradiction at that time, but I knew that the world was created and the world was not created could both be true at the same time. I knew there was a problem. And what I was getting at school, there's this thing in theology that they call deferred authority. And a lot of the times parents don't realize this, but within the kid's mind, when you send them to school, mom and dad are sending me to school, obviously they agree with what I'm being taught. They know that I'm being taught truth. And a lot of the times the parents have no clue what is being taught in school, okay? My whole identity was wrapped up in my Christian faith, okay? But here it was now. I was starting to think, was my faith the God of the gaps? Was I just filling in places with God that science had just not answered yet? You guys might not be familiar with this guy. You probably are, <laughs> Carl Sagan. He was the first Cosmos series. He taught at Princeton and some other places, but he said, the Cosmos is all that is or was or ever will be. 
very biblical in its allusion uh, to the way God talks about himself. Uh, nowadays, it's Neil deGrasse Tyson, okay? You may have heard of Richard Dawkins. I started reading a lot of this literature when I was in middle school. Um, I was one of those that I loved to read and I absorbed or I just devoured everything I had. I love his shirt. I don't, know, I don't think you can read it. It says religion, together we can find a cure. So uh, he does, he thinks it's like a virus that has gone through. But anyways, I started reading these. I went into Darwin's On the Origin of Species. This was the, the basis of the thought. And it's interesting, I didn't know it now, or I didn't know it then, but looking at his journal, there were many places where he said, I think he was making hypotheses. He was guessing. Um, but I was always taught, and I think most of you in here are probably taught that it's, it's fact. It's non-controvertible fact. Um, there's actually even legal precedence that says that basically if you try to come against it in some places, you can have some legal ramifications. So basically, I started evaluating everything through the worldview that I now believed was true to reality. No one could answer my questions. Everyone in authority seemed to be telling me that evolution was true. I didn't divert or I didn't get into all the evidences, okay? And so basically I started looking at scripture this way, similar to how Thomas Jefferson, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Thomas Jefferson's Bible, he cut out all the miracles, okay? So it was very selective and I thought this cannot be true. Now this book was not out when these thoughts were going through my head. This book came out later, but what actually it does is it distills what was happening in my life and in my thought processes. His name is Daniel Dennett. He wrote this book in 1995, okay? But he says, let me lay my cards on the table. If I were to give an award for the single best idea anyone ever had, I'd give it to Darwin, ahead of even Newton or Einstein, anyone else, in a single stroke. The idea of evolution by natural selection unifies the realm of life, it's interesting, he goes on meaning and purpose, which in other writings of his, he actually denies the existence of meaning and purpose, but that's, we'll get to that later. But with the realm of space and time, cause and effect, mechanism and natural law, it is the foundation for everything. So everything that you see around you has to be explicable in these terms, okay? And that's what I thought it was, okay? Later in the book, he puts forth an analogy. Universal acid is a liquid so corrosive that it will eat through anything. The problem is, what do you keep it in? Little did I realize that in a few years, I would encounter an idea, Darwin's idea bearing an unmistakable likeness to universal acid. He said, but it threatened to leak out answering, offering answers, welcome or not, all the way down. This is an all-encompassing worldview. It has to answer the questions of origin, meaning, morality, destiny, and identity. It has to be an explanatory system for everything as we know it. And this is where the two chairs comes in, in the sense that we need to be able to sit in that chair, as we're going to do in a second, and be able to evaluate, does this make sense of reality as we know it to be? Or is it absurd? Okay, and that's what the reductio does. Okay? So basically, one of the last books that I read that kind of toppled me over. And I would say at the time I read it, I did not grasp everything um, in it, obviously. But one thing I did, towards the end of the book, this, um, his name is David Hume. He's considered the, one of the greatest skeptics that ever lived. He was Scottish. Basically, he wrote this at the end of this treatise on uh, concerning human understanding. He says, if we take in our hand any volume or any book of divinity, so theology or school of metaphysics, that's philosophy, parts of philosophy, for instance, let us ask, does it contain any abstract reasoning concerning quantity or number, pure mathematics, or maybe pure logic? No, does it contain any experimental reasoning concerning matter of fact and existence? Things we can do with our five senses. Can we put it on a Bunsen burner? Can we do experiments with it? No. Well, then commit it then to the flames, for it can contain nothing but sophistry, which is deception and illusion. Does anybody see a problem with this statement? I didn't see it at the time when I was younger. It's a contradictory statement. His statement actually is a statement of philosophy. It's not a mathematical statement. It is not a 
statement that is arrived at because of scientific investigation. It is a philosophical statement about science, about divinity, about theology. This actually commits incoherence. It is necessarily false, okay? It's interesting. So basically he said, if it's not scientifically testable, it's not knowledge. I felt like I had a buddy Jesus. He was there as Freud would say, he is a wish fulfillment or he is a crutch that allows people like me who are weak to able to navigate through uh, life. And I didn't wanna be weak, okay? But it's interesting. If we just look at his thing where he's talking about that life, the most, the only thing, he started a trend And we're going through the coronavirus pandemic right now. We don't know exactly what we're fighting against. We have ideas. We know the type of virus. We're trying to create a vaccine. We're not sure exactly what the long-term effects are. So scientifically, there's a lot we don't know. But the one thing we do know, all of us know, and that's why we're wearing masks, is that it's not right to kill people who are innocent. So what is more foundational? our understanding of moral truths, our understanding of scientific truths, okay? Later in his book, it's kind of interesting, or earlier in his book, sorry, he goes, yet Hume, and this is, uh, and again, the, the handout you have has all the quotes and where I got them from. So yet Hume found it impossible to maintain his skepticism when he left his study, when he joined his friends for a uh, game of backgammon, as he put it, in the occupations of everyday life, Hume wrote, skeptical doubts vanish like smoke, leave the most determined skeptic in the same condition as other mortals. He knew it was unlivable. This was more parlor games for him, okay? And so basically this at the time in my life, I felt like I was finally lifting up a veil. If you've ever seen the Truman Show, Everything about Truman's life is a lie. He's basically been, since the day he was born, it's basically been on TV. He basically has been being played as a reality TV show. And I felt, and I hadn't watched the movie obviously by this time, but I felt that everything I believed was a lie. And I left the church. Now, I didn't leave the church Physically, I love my parents, I respected my parents, and so it, I didn't really actually leave the church until when I went away to college, when I left, moved to California, things of that nature. Ironically, from studies that they're showing, the average age of somebody converting or leaving the faith is 11 years old, okay? So people are leaving the faith, they're still in the church, and so I left. So basically, I believed that what I had been brought up was a lie. I don't know if any of you have been in a position where everything you had held dear to that point was taken away. Everything that you thought was true was wrong. And you kind of feel like you're in a wasteland, T.S. Eliot. <laughs> you are basically nobody nowhere. So I started getting into drugs at this time, primarily because of this guy, and it wasn't for recreational purpose. His name is Aldous Huxley. He wrote a book called The Doors of Perception, also Heaven and Hell. It was included in this one together. But he quotes from Blake, and basically what it is is he takes peyote progressively through the writing of these books. And so he's writing while he's all doped up. It says, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to man as it is, infinite. For man has closed himself up till he sees all things through narrow chinks of his cavern. The only hope that I had at this time is that I would find something that was true to reality that could return me to a position of hope and meaning, okay? I got into a lot of really whacked out stuff. Um, these are some of the books you may be familiar, and I know a lot of you are not readers. Um, I'm finding out more and more that I'm in the minority when it comes to reading. I think I scared my kids away in reading because I go through anywhere between two and four books a week. And I think when my kids saw me reading and I wanted them to read, they were like, if that's what reading is, I want nothing to do with it, <laughs> okay? Some of these you've probably read in school. Some of these you've probably never heard of, okay? Um, so you can see if you're familiar, uh, Michel Foucault, he is a postmodernist, um, okay? We have Frederick Nietzsche. We have Viktor Frankl, which we'll get to in a second. We have people like Camus. I read things like the Communist Manifesto, Jean-Paul Sartre with nausea, read Mein Kampf, okay? 
uh, Alistair Crowley. Most people are only familiar with him because of the Ozzy Osbourne song or Led Zeppelin uh, because Jimmy Page owns the Balski Manor, which was his home. Uh, he was part of basically a magical organization called the uh, Order of the Golden Dawn. Um, so, but Waiting for Godot, Heart of Darkness, Brave New World. So a lot of these, you can see Kafka's The Trial is very interesting. On his 30th birthday, he has authorities come to his house and he is uh, told that he has been, he's, they're looking at a crime he committed. He never finds out what his crime is. And in the end, a year later, they execute him. So there's a lot within this book. Kafka is very, but basically his view on life is that he was thrown into a situation where he didn't ask for it. There was no hope. He didn't know the meaning. He didn't know the purpose. And all there was was execution at the end. Not stuff that you really want to, you know, uh, go to bed reading a lot of the times. This one probably was one of the most impactful. It's a fiction book. It's by Goethe. Uh, he wrote many things, obviously. But this one was called The Sorrows of Young Werther. And in the end, the protagonist ends up committing suicide. Um, my first tattoo that I ever got was when I was 16, okay? It's on my back still to this day, and it's very paradoxical. It's actually an ankh, which in Egyptian mythology, one of its meanings is eternal life, <clears throat> but it looks like a gravestone, and across it has the words Werther. So at 16, I could also see, I could see at this time that this is probably how my life was going to end because I did not see that there could be any answers outside of what I was learning within atheism. Uh, a lot of the uh, spiritual stuff wasn't making sense. They didn't have evidence for it, things of that nature. And so I continued to go towards scientific naturalism. Okay. Now, many of you may get your information or your worldviews through other things. Um, most you know, kids I talk to, it's through movies. It's through television. I don't know if you've seen Black Mirror. Uh, it's pretty intense. It's like a very dark version of the Twilight Zone. Brings up a lot of questions about life, especially from a materialistic standpoint. Or how about music? Now, I will be surprised if anybody knows who that is. Anybody? This was one of my favorite bands. They are the Dead Kennedys. The Dead Kennedys were a punk band. The main guy's name was Jello Biafra. He was actually from Boulder. Um, very politically active. Uh, plastic surgery disaster is what this is. A lot of political commentary, but also very nihilistic, very hopeless. So a lot of people, I think, get their worldview like catching a cold through their movies that they watch. They don't analyze or through the music that they listen to, through the books that they read, okay? So basically, this put me in a position. Um, I am by nature, unfortunately, I suffer from severe depression. And so I had these ideas. I had fear. I had guilt. I had shame. I had what I hoped for, love. But according to the worldview that I was now embracing, none of those had substance. They weren't true to reality. They were constructions that I had created. So what do you do? Well, I went to Europe. <laughs> I actually did a foreign exchange to Finland, which was probably not the best thing for me because they had the highest suicide rate for any developed country in the world at the time that I went over. Uh, they were introducing uh, vitamin D lamps, things of that nature, because they thought maybe it was seasonal affective disorder, trying to get people out of this stupor that they seemed to be in. Okay, so I was over there for about 10 months. When I came back, I did what was expected of me more because I had no idea what I wanted to do. Uh, and I, by this time, my drug use was not um, for scientific or for expanding my consciousness or anything like that. It was to escape. Uh, and so when I came back, I had almost a full ride to the School of Mines. Colorado College, I had absolutely no scholarships, but I had been accepted to both. And to my parents' chagrin, I ended up going to Colorado College, Colorado Springs. Uh, at this time, DU was the only school more expensive in the state. So my parents, you could tell, loved me. Uh, but so went to Colorado Springs, studied comparative religion and philosophy. Okay? We were actually getting ready for, uh, I was in a Theravada Buddhism class, and so we were studying for a test that we had uh, the next day. A friend of mine who was a, a political science major, and he actually went down to Mexico to study the elections. 
That is not a safe job. Uh, he actually, I remember seeing him the last time I saw him, he had come back, he had gone down there. He was supposed to be there for a year, was there for six months. And he said, I barely got out with my life. But anyways, you guys got to watch me after four o'clock. I start free associating, so I apologize. But he had an herb that he had brought back from Mexico. Uh, it was a legal herb. It wasn't illegal in the United States. And so we decided to smoke it. It had similar attributes to marijuana. The only problem is I had an allergic reaction. Uh, this is Betcher Health Center, Colorado College. I was there for a week. And I was, on top of other things, I was hallucinating. I knew I was hallucinating, but I couldn't stop it. It was a reaction similar to if people take uh, things like uh, Percocet or things of that nature. Sometimes they can induce hallucinations. So, of course, what does a college do if one of your students is hallucinating for a week in your health center, you ask for a psychological evaluation. Um, at this time, I decided I didn't see the purpose in school. If what I believed was true to reality, I was not going to waste my time. I ended up going out to the Bay Area. My sister lived out there. If you are a confused individual, the Bay Area is not a place to go. Uh, you can get yourself into a lot of trouble really quick. What ended up happening, I lived out there for a couple of years. And it was actually one of the first times I was never into uh, cocaine, things of that nature. I wanted drugs. I, I preferred hallucinogens. Well, I had a friend that was into crack. Uh, and so this was the first time that I had taken crack. Um, and basically, I was up for about 48 hours. And so I had gone down. I don't know if you've ever been to uh, Central California or Upper California and gone to Monterey. The beaches in Monterey are just beautiful. So a lot of them are private, but I had some friends and we would sneak down and we knew how to sneak down. So at this time, I came down from the city and I went to uh, Monterey. So I was wanting to see the sunrise and kind of just think things through. Well, what happened is I started uh, to feel different, more different than I usually did. Um, and I started to get tunnel vision. I started to have some effects. I ended up driving up to Salinas. By the time I got to Salinas, I knew that I probably was going to pass out. I thought I was almost positive that I had overdosed um, because I had continued to take some other things. Um, and so when I get there, I move into a, or I go into a mom and pop hamburger stand and I sit down at the table and I said, I'm sorry, I think I've overdosed. Next thing I noticed that I was at the hospital. They took me to the hospital in Salinas. Uh, the doctor told me that I was just a short way away from renal failure uh, because of what was happening. So at this time, then I started suffering from panic attacks. Um, I would eventually put myself into a program. And the reason I put myself into a program is because I love to go up to the cliffs at Pacifica. I would go up to Pacifica and I would sit and I would just watch. But for the first time in my life, I felt that I had lost all control, that if I went there, I didn't think that I could stop myself from throwing myself off the cliff. Um, my life had totally fallen apart. Um, everything around me was disastrous. So basically, I became on focused on one idea throughout my reading. And it's summarized best in uh, Camus' book. It's called The Myth of Sisyphus and Other Essays. And the very first essay in it is called The Absurd Reasoning. And basically, Camus, uh, if you're familiar with Greek uh, uh, mythology, Sisyphus at one time was the king of Corinth, and he had evaded death a couple of times and some other things that he did, and Zeus was kind of torqued. And so Zeus basically finally got a hold of him, condemned him to Hades to constantly roll a rock up a hill just for it to roll back down. So it was a punishment of pure meaninglessness. And so we're also going to talk about Viktor Frankl and then, of course, The Sorrows of Young Werther. So there was a multiplicity of books that were having the same idea. But his quote is this, there is but one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. Judging whether life is or is not worth living amounts to answering the fundamental question of philosophy. He says everything else is fluff. This is the primary question the philosophy must answer. I was at a position of no hope. There was absolutely no hope. I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you feel that everything is worthless. Everything is of no value. There's no such thing as value. Your life is meaningless. And so Viktor Frankl came up with an equation. It first came out in his book, The Unconscious God. But he basically came up with a simple equation. As he said, whenever someone, a human person, experiences suffering and it's devoid of meaning, 
He said it always leads to despair. He said there are two types of people in the world, and Frank Turek uh, says this as well. There's are those who have hope, and there are those who have despair. Okay? And so basically, he said, I discovered this in my third concentration camp. He lost most of his family uh, during the Holocaust, uh, last being Auschwitz. And he said, as soon as he saw the people lose hope, they were gone. He says they were dead. Okay? So a lot of people will come up and say, as we're doing kind of the argument between the two, many people will say, Scott, that's not a necessary conclusion. Because remember, I'm sitting in the seat. I'm living what an atheist worldview or a naturalistic worldview portrays. And so what I try to tell people is, yes, there are people who are atheistic that live very happy lives. But I say, I think that's primarily because either they don't care or they don't understand what the ramifications are. And so I always go back at the very end. This is the end of his um, essay on an absurd reasoning that started with the fundamental question of philosophy is whether suicide is legitimate or not. So he goes on, this is his conclusion. The absurd man, and the absurd man is the man who even though everything is nothingness, it's like the guy Nietzsche used to talk about that would stand on the side of Mount Vesuvius even though he knew it would explode but he was gonna defy, even though he knew that he was going to die. He said, the absurd man thus catches sight of a burning and frigid, transparent and limited universe in which nothing is possible, but everything is given and beyond which all is collapse and nothingness. He can then decide to accept such a universe and draw from it his strength, his refusal to hope and the unyielding evidence of a life without consolation. Now that's a chipper idea, isn't it? Okay? But when you take it through and you look at what they are, and we're going to get more into it. And so basically, that equation led me to El Camino Hospital. Uh, it was in Mountain View. The one that I went into is in Mountain View, California. But what started happening is they had taken me to counseling, but most of the counselors were evolutionary psychologists or psychiatrists. And so I had already thought about what they were proposing to me and I saw the end of it, that it was hopeless, it was useless. It really gave me no value, it gave me no meaning. There were other problems that we'll get to later. Finally, and you can tell I had some really good friends. Actually, the person who brought this in was a really good friend, but most people did not understand what I was going through. Uh, so one person brought in, one flew over the cuckoo's nest. If you've ever seen it, it's about a, insane asylum, and in the end, the guy gets lobotomized. They wouldn't let her bring in the movie. <laughs> but they did let her bring in the Looney Tunes cards. So you can see that a lot of the times, and, and many of us, I don't think, think through. I think that's why so many people are afraid to not have something distracting them. They're afraid to be with their own thoughts. They're afraid to think about some of these questions of life. Finally, they said, Scott, will you talk to a priest? At this time, I was on an eight-week lockdown, and so I couldn't leave the facility. And I said, well, I'm here. Go ahead, bring him in. I, I especially didn't think <clears throat> that he would have anything. But ironically, this gentleman was uh, experienced in what is called apologetics. Apologetics comes from the Greek word apologia, which means a legal defense, like a courtroom defense. It's a subgroup of theology uh, that is out there to try to defend the Christian faith and its truth claims about the universe and the world against other competing claims. And so basically he came up and he said, well, actually what he did is he listened to me for about, I don't, I can't remember, 45 minutes, an hour. He just said, what is your evidence? Why did you come to that conclusion? What is it that you've been told? And then he finally said, I don't think you've been told everything. He says, it seems to me that you've looked at one side of the equation and not others. Now, I did not consciously think this at this time. This is actually a Psalm, one of my favorite Psalms. But I truly felt that some of my upbringing, what my parents had brought me up in, was at the point where I was crying out to God. I was saying, God, if you are there. And I love this. It says, some were fools through their sinful ways. That was me especially. And because of their iniquity, suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food. I remember at times the psychiatrist, when I was in the lockdown, they had to force me to eat because I, I had no desire to eat. I had no desire to live. I had desire for nothing. And they drew near to the gates of death then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word and he healed them. He delivered them from their destruction. 
let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man, and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds and songs of joy. That's why I'm so passionate about what I do, because I wanted to have answers that no one could give me. And so I don't want people to go through the thing, same thing I did. And the reason I put this up here is because archaeologically, that is called the Tel Dan Stele. And a lot of the times, people will try to say you certain things are not confirmed in the Bible. David never existed. Yet this is a 9th century BCE uh, tablet that talks about the house of David. So we have great archaeological evidence for what we believe. Okay? But basically, he said, you're, you're kind of stuck in a box. He said, you haven't thought much. He wasn't, you know, trying to insult me. He started to give me arguments. Now, this is from a book called Cold Case Christianity, but these are some of the arguments. He started simply with questions. He said, let me ask you a couple of questions. He said, you're a scientific person, right? Did the universe begin to exist? Yes, there's many things that point to the beginning of the time, space, matter, energy, both Einstein's theories, laws of thermodynamics, um, all these different postulations, the uh, expansion of the universe. And so I said, of course. He said, let me ask you a second question. If there was ever a time in the past that nothing existed, would anything exist today? And of course, from nothing, nothing comes. He said, so something has to be eternal. And the universe is not eternal. The universe came into existence. So he said, don't you think from a cause and effect relationship, he said, don't you think that that thing that brought the universe into existence, and if time, space, matter, energy came into existence, it has to be outside of space. It has to be outside of time. It has to be immaterial because matter did not exist. So he goes on and on and on like this. Simple, very simple. But things that you don't hear a lot from in a lot of the books that I was reading. He said, you know, Scott, he said, you're expecting God to come down and answer all your questions. He said, but the world doesn't look, work like that. He said, we see the effects of things most of the time, even when it comes to the virus. We don't see the virus, but we see the effects of the virus. We necessarily don't see wind, but we see the effects of the wind. Can we into it or can we infer cause and effect relationship? Well, that's what all science is based on. Okay, so was it an intellectual problem? As I started digging, when I got out of the um, hospital, I was definitely not a Christian. The only thing that really I knew for sure is that atheism wasn't true. But I didn't know what was true, but my hope returned. Because now there had to be some kind of a God. Uh, was it a force? Uh, was it, you know, I didn't know. But I started to look along those lines. So was it just an intellectual problem? Okay, I started looking through history, and there have been arguments going forth all the way back to Cicero. Cicero said, when we see something moved by machinery, he actually was uh, a senator, he was an orator, he was a Stoic philosopher, uh, but he was also, um, and the title, uh, I think it's Tribune, I can't remember. But there was a position in Rome, in the Republic of Rome, that only two people held a year. And he held that. So he was very prominent. Okay? So he says, when we see something moved by machinery, like an orrery or model of the planetary systems, or a clock, or any other such things, we no doubt that these contrivances are the work of reason. We therefore, when we behold the whole compass of the heaven, and this is Cicero, says, moving with revolutions of marvelous velocity and perfect regularity. How can we doubt that all this affected, not merely by reason, but by a reason that is transcendent in divine? You see not the deity, yet by the contemplation of his works, you are led to acknowledge God. So this is not a new argument. Simply what this guy was telling me is the cause must be adequate or capable for the effect. Water does not rise above its source. There's no way that the water in this tower is going to get to the top of the skyscraper. It's an impossibility unless there's pumps, things of that nature. And so what we start looking at is the cause and effect relationship. And I like this little video. It kind of hits home the point.
Evolution is a destructive force. You have mutation, you have death, you have dismemberment, but yet we are expected that that cause creates the beauty, the complexity, the, the magnificent glory that we see in the world around us. And I don't think we think through it sometimes, okay? So it's interesting. <clears throat> so I thought, is this just an intellectual argument? And I saw that it wasn't. There were many ways that atheists were denying. And so I went to Freud and I started thinking about Freud. And actually I ended up finding a book written by this gentleman. His name is Paul Witz. Actually it was an essay at the time. The book had not come out. He was an NYU professor, okay? And he wrote a book called The Faith of the Fatherless. What he wanted to do is he wanted to see, is there a trend? Because when it comes to Freud, Freud said that we have wish fulfillment. We want a big daddy in the sky. We don't want the world to be as harsh as it is. So we project our desires. What he actually found out is that when he looked at, when he could get biographical information on prominent atheists like Camus and Kafka, when you look at people like, uh, um, well, you know, Freud himself, you look at Marx, you look at others. He said, what, is there a common denominator? He found out that they all had horrible, or most of them had horrible relationships with their fathers. They detested their fathers. And so basically he came out with a psychological evaluation that said, ooh, Freud's sword cuts both ways. Is it a projection that the atheists are doing because they don't want a gun? We're actually gonna see a quote here in a second. So I had to look in to find out, well, is it wish fulfillment? Is it just we're believing what we want? Okay, then uh, this guy's name, his name is Johnson. He's amazing, he's British, he's funny, um, but he's a great historian. He wrote a book called Intellectuals. The other thing I had to look at, we always hear that Christians are hypocrites, okay? So I started looking, he basically looks at the biography to show that really hypocrisy is not a Christian thing, it's a human thing. So I started delving into all these areas. One of them especially was the problem of evil. Now, it is true, I had a pastor who unfortunately passed away, he loved technology. And so he read uh, Steve Jobs' biography. He was raised in Missouri Synod Lutheran and he actually left the faith because he did not feel he got an adequate answer to the problem of evil. But I think that it's interesting because you really can't ask the question of the problem of evil without there being something outside. Let me give you an example. So really the problem of evil comes down to, do we have free will? Because if we do not have free will, then you don't have the ability to choose. If you don't have the ability to choose, there's no way that you can choose the good or that, or even know if there's good or bad. It's just things are. Okay, this in, in uh, logic is called the is-ought fallacy, and we try to bring morality out of things that just are, and it doesn't work that way. So basically, according to scientific naturalism and according to Christianity, Christianity believes that we do have free will. We have what is called agency. We can actually make choices. We can get above and outside of the physical world because we are actually made of two components. We have an immaterial part, and we have a physical part, okay? We are enfleshed souls. But atheism says that everything is a domino effect, and we're actually gonna go to their words. Does anybody like British humor? Somewhat, I'm finding out most people don't like British humor. This comes from Faulty Towers. He also played in another, in uh, Monty Python. Okay, maybe I love British humor. So I have to say, but why did I show you that? It actually goes to a quote from Richard Dawkins. Richard Dawkins was actually addressing a group 
And we're gonna see that his contradiction is brought forth. First, we're gonna to go to an article that he wrote, and it was basically on <clears throat> the idea of morality. He says, of course we laugh, and he's referencing this episode of Basil beating his car. He said, why don't we laugh? He says, of course we laugh, Dawkins writes, but why don't we laugh at a judge who punishes a criminal? Doesn't a truly scientific mechanistic view of the nervous system make nonsense of the very idea of responsibility? So he was caught in this. And so he was asked in an interview, he said, the interviewer said, but don't you see an inconsistency in your views, a contradiction in your views? Dawkins replied, I, I sort of do, yes, but it is an inconsistency that we sort of have to live with. Otherwise, life would be intolerable. Does that make any sense? That's incoherent. I think of it this way. Basically, what Dawkins is saying is similar to, you know, what do you need to boil water? You need water, you usually need a pan, and you need heat. What if I told you that you also needed a leprechaun? You'd look at me like I was nuts. Here, what he is doing is he's basically saying we have no free will, but we have to act like we have free will, or it would be unbearable. You have no choice. You can't change anything about it but yet he's calling you. He's showing that he cannot live by his own standard, okay? This is not just Dawkins. We look at, and this is one of the most uh, prominent biographies. It was just written a couple of years ago um, on Einstein. And it quotes Einstein as saying, human beings in their thinking, feeling, and acting are not free, but are as causally bound as the stars in their motions. So basically, <clears throat> according to scientific thought, as soon as the Big Bang went off, everything else is dominoes. Everything else is a cause and effect relationship. You cannot overcome. You cannot get outside of that cause and effect relationship. Since there is no immaterial, there is no mind. So everything is acted upon. You have no choice. So when it comes to here, when you have men, you have things of that nature, we are still no free will, no consciousness, okay? Things that we know are true about reality, okay? But then he goes on, he says, yet on the other hand, he said, I am compelled to act as if free will existed. So he's acting. Does he have any opportunity within his worldview for free will to act any way other than what he has been caused to do? No, it's pure incoherence. It's, it's insanity. He said, because if I want to live in a civilized society, I must act responsibly. There's no free will. There's no choice. How do you act responsibly when you have no ability to act? Okay. Then the last guy, his name is Martin Minsky. He actually set up the artificial intelligence laboratory at MIT. He's passed away, but he's best known for his idea that the brain is nothing more than a three pound computer made of meat. Okay. So it's interesting though, he goes on and he says, surprisingly, however, he says, does that mean we must embrace the modern scientific view and put aside the ancient myth of voluntary choice? No, we can't do that. Do you see that every one of these authors, what they're saying is they have the free will and the ability to believe illusions, to change their mind, to change the course of history, but their worldview doesn't allow it. So when you sit in their chair and you take their assumptions, it makes everything absurd because they violate it every time they put forth their will. They show that their worldview is not true to reality, okay? He says, no, we can't do that. He says, why not, Minsky goes on, no matter what the physical world provides, or no matter that the physical world provides no room for freedom of will, that concept is essential to our models of the mental realm. He goes on, we cannot ever give it up. We're virtually forced to maintain that belief even though we know it's false. You guys, these are MIT scientists. These are considered the brainiacs. And they are, when it comes to science, these guys are phenomenal. What they do, but when it comes to philosophy and just thinking through things, They've got a lot to be desired. It's interesting. Uh, one of my favorite atheists, his name is Michael Ruse. He's a philosopher of science. He actually writes a lot of forewords to Christian books because he's actually willing to engage the ideas. And he said, every time Dawkins writes a book, he says, I'm embarrassed to be an atheist. He said, because his philosophy and his understanding and his ignorance makes us all look bad. Okay, so 
but these are the things that they believe. So I also had to look into the idea, is God a recycled Messiah? Is it just the Mithras themes? Is it just Osiris? Is it these kind of myths that have been just recombined and foisted upon us by this Christian group? This book, whoops, sorry, Really, in the academic circles, this has been an abolished idea since the 1920s. But people, unfortunately, are a little behind, and you hear this all the time. This is a fantastic book that goes through the history. And, and actually, most of the ideologies that they try to say Christianity absorbed, especially when it comes to Mithras, actually comes more after Christianity. So it, if anything, it would be pulling from the other side but it's so far apart, but that is a great book. But what I started to see is with the problem of evil, I saw that there were emotional reasons that people did not want to deal because really from an atheistic standpoint, you don't even have the ability to ask the question or to claim that somebody is doing bad things, okay? And so I started to see the edifice of basically of atheism totally dissolve. Okay, everything was coming undone. I was finding that there are multiple reasons that people deny the faith. Maybe they don't have intellectual questions answered. Maybe they've had the death of somebody close to them. Darwin himself lost his daughter. And a lot of people believe that a lot of things changed within him. Hope, things of that nature. Volitional reasons, this just means acts of will. And there's also bias. There are so many times that I've talked to people and said, if I could convince you, if I could give you the evidence that what you believe is not true, would you change your mind? No. Okay, we'll move on. That is a bias and volitional. When I think of volitional reasons, I think of Nietzsche's Ubermensch, the overman, the will to power. And I think this is exceptionally uh, shown forth in this gentleman. This gentleman is an atheist. He's also at NYU, okay? His name is Thomas Nagel. Um, I don't believe he's still teaching there. Brilliant philosopher. Most of the stuff that he did was in mind, body philosophy, and in political uh, theory as well. But listen to this. He says, in speaking of the fear of religion, the fear of religion itself, I speak from experience, being strongly subject to this fear myself. I want atheism to be true, and I am made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. He goes on. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right. In, that, in my belief, it's that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. Okay? So he's actually very defiantly. Listen to this. This is, his name is Richard Lewontin. He was a genet geneticist at Harvard. Uh, and as I go through his defense of the differences between what scientists believe and what the world actually shows. Think if this was a Christian using the argument that he's using and what would be the response? So basically he says, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the real struggle between science and the supernatural. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs. So it's almost like evolution can answer everything or an evolution of the gaps kind of theory. He said, in spite of its failure to fulfill many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just so stories. If you're not familiar with what just so stories are, they were made famous primarily by a British author who wrote the Jungle Book, Rudyard Kipling. And these just so stories are how did the elephant get its long tongue or long tongue, long trunk? How did the tiger get its spots or its stripes? And so what it was is it was these nonsensical stories that were told to kids that were meant to be fun. And that's what he's making reference to because we have an a prior commitment to materialism. It's not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but on the contrary, we are forced by our a priori, which basically means you come in with the idea before you evaluate the evidence, our a priori adherence to material causes, to create an apparatus for investigation. No other options, period, okay? Moreover, that materialism is absolute. We cannot allow a divine foot in the door. We know that Christianity is against common sense. We know that it makes no sense. It's a leap of blind faith. We know that it really makes nonsense out of things that we know. It goes contrary to what we know is true about reality, like free will and consciousness, right and wrong. But you know what? We're going to believe it anyway, so why don't you come join us? 
it's sad because a lot of the times, these are the kind of arguments when we really press them that they have, okay? Uh, so what is science really about? Expelled, if you've seen it, if you like Ben Stein, Bueller, Bueller, <laughs> he's great. Uh, but he talks about how many academics are getting kicked out. In all honesty, so what is science really about? Does Christianity defy science? I really like in his Cosmo series what Neil deGrasse Tyson puts forth. Uh, I think the problem is, kind of like Alice in Wonderland, uh, I give myself such very good advice, but I very seldom take it. Um, and we're going to see if they adhere to these things, I think they would be different. And it's interesting, oblivious to the rest of the cosmos, we inhabited a kind of prison. Let me ask you, according to naturalism, are we freed from that prison? A prison is something where you have nothing that you can get out of. But isn't that what materialism teaches us? So beginning already when he's presenting what the scientific worldview is, he's already contradicted himself. We have no free will. There was no way that we could escape. It was not anything on our part. It was the work of generations of searchers who took five simple rules to heart. If you take a rule to heart, then you have the ability to do things that consciousness requires, intellect requires, whether right or wrong requires, you need a morality because are you gonna be honest in what you discover? But his worldview can't sustain any of that. But he goes on, he says, question authority. No idea is true just because someone says so, including me. Awesome, I love that. But yet when people try to, even in the front of biology books in places like Louisiana, they just wanted to put up a notice that said there are very good prominent scientists who do not believe the theory of evolution is well-founded and there are other theories. It didn't say that evolution was wrong. It didn't say that it shouldn't be taught, but yet it went to court and just that statement was excluded from the books. Is that how science works? Aren't we supposed to question things? But again, in the classroom, in the university, most of the time you do not have that ability. Think for yourself, question yourself, don't believe anything just because you want to. Believing doesn't make it so. But a lot of the publications, when you get into these scientific journals, you're not allowed to question because you can't even submit something unless it fits the paradigm of the worldview that they have. You're not allowed, people are not allowed to see the evidence, okay? Test ideas with evidence gained from observation and experiment. Evolution is proved by analogy, most cases. It is not proven by the evidence. They make leaps of, or they basically do speculation. And they foster it off as if it is guaranteed science. You don't prove things by analogy. You prove things by fact and you use analogy to help people to understand them, okay? So if we look at experiment, and we're gonna to get to it in just a second. Number four, follow the evidence wherever it leads. If you have no evidence, we reserve judgment. I love to bring this in. So what do these look like? Anyone? Bueller? What does that look like? Say that again? Beets. Beets. Well, it could be pepperoni. These are actually parts, you can see the shape of the red blood cells. You can actually see ligaments. They actually are stretchy. Does anybody want to take a guess what these came out of? They came out of a 90 million year old T-Rex fossil. Okay, so we have things. We actually have partially degraded DNA. Uh, we have things like hemoglobin. We have, there are actually over 16 different biological components that they have identified. Now, how many of you heard of unfossilized dinosaur bones? Okay, a couple of you. Most people, when I talk to high schools and college, most no, nobody has heard of this. Do you know when this was first discovered? 25 years ago. You think something as revolutionary as this, more people would know about. Since then, there's been a compilation of people who have compiled the evidence. They've even found things that are supposedly 500 million years old that still have soft things that have not fossilized. Now we know from observational science that the longest lasting because of its structure, things of that nature is collagen. Collagen under perfect, almost perfect circumstances, the longest it can last is 900,000 years. That's perfect situation. We haven't had that, but still 
500 million years, 90 million years, things like that. Observational science tells us that they wouldn't exist, but they will not change their paradigm. She actually, the woman who first uh, discovered this, it was discovered by accident. Her name was Mary Schweitzer, but she sent it out. She actually did her, her review, I think 17 times, because she didn't believe what she was actually seeing. She said, I had one reviewer tell me that he didn't care what the data said. He knew what I was finding was impossible. I wrote back and I said, well, what data would convince you? And he said, none. Is he open? No, I don't think he's open to see where the evidence leads. Okay. And perhaps the most important rule of all is that remember you could be wrong, humility. And if you are in the scientific field or even in uh, more of what they call the soft sciences with archeology span and other things, it's cults of personality, it's paradigms. You can't break forth from them. You're not allowed to be wrong, okay? And it's interesting. So science this way is, is amazing. It is meant to help us to understand the world around us by trial and error. And it's interesting because it truly does then take off the blinders. We can, because in a Christian worldview, we know that we have will. We can pursue things. We have those things that are necessary for science to take place. Neil deGrasse Tyson, if you want, I can give you his Isaac Asimov lecture. He actually believes that the most probable case is that we live in a computer simulation, that we are basically a computer model that a higher intelligence, just not God, but a higher intelligence is using. Do computers, do simulations within a computer have free will? No, they are a program. They are done by other, other agencies, okay? I love Karl Popper, if you ever get a chance, it's a big book, but it's great. He believed in the idea of falsification, that if you falsify an idea, all you need is one thing. If it falsifies, your idea is dead. But what we do now in science is we corroborate. We find things. We end up in an echo chamber. But what we really need to do is we need to say, can we falsify it? Okay? But science is not working that way. Okay? Going back to Thomas Nagel. I love this book. Now, remember, he does not want the universe to be a theistic universe. This is one of his books. It's called Mind and Cosmos, Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. And he gives these reasons. Okay? So this is a book. He's not well-liked by atheists, okay? even though he is one. And really, it's a call to arms. What he's saying is there are things we know that are true about reality. We'll get to it in a second. He said, Neo-Darwinism, scientific naturalism, cannot give us answers. If it is meant to be an explanatory structure to give us answers, it fails. It cannot produce what we know the world to be like, okay? Brilliant guy. Remember, he does not want a theistic universe, but these are the things. He says concepts he considers unintelligible, meaning there's no way to make sense of them. There's no way to answer these things. There is nothing in the Darwinian model that can account for these things we know are true. One is consciousness, okay? And this is, it's great because studying tra uh, um, transhumanism with a lot of people thinking that you can upload your intelligence or your mind to a computer, misunderstand the whole idea. They don't know what consciousness is. They think it arises out of matter or is it something else? But he says, if the mental, the way we think is not itself merely physical. It cannot be fully explained by physical science. Evolutionary naturalism implies that we shouldn't take any of our convictions seriously, including the scientific world picture on which evolutionary naturally itself depends. They're cutting off the branch they're sitting on because they say reason really isn't out there. It's a domino effect. So really, our convictions aren't telling us true or false. It's just what is. There's no actual idea of true and false. He goes on. He said this whole idea of intelligibility. He said the natural sciences. Why can we understand the world? Why does it make sense? Why are these things seen through the natural sciences? There is no meaning. There is no value. There is no right or wrong. He goes on. He says there is no room for agency or free will in a world of neural impulses, chemical reactions, and bone and muscle movements. Given naturalism, it's hard not to conclude that we're helpless and not responsible for our actions. Social justice, everything we see going on right now with Black Lives Matter or whatever is really a farce if naturalism is true because there is no right or wrong. It's all opinion. 
It's all subjective analysis. True or false, another atheist from the London School of Economics, his name is John Gray, wrote a book called Straw Dogs. And he said, modern humanism is the faith that through science, humankind can know the truth and so be free. But if Darwin's theory of natural selection is true, this is impossible. The human mind serves evolutionary success, not truth. Okay, so these are all the things he said, judgments we make, are they just brute facts? He goes on to conclude. He says, I find this view, talking about Darwinism, antecedently unbelievable, a heroic triumph of ideological theory over common sense. I would be willing to bet that the present right-thinking consensus will come to seem laughable in a generation or two. But then he goes on, he says, though of course it may be replaced by a new consensus that is just as invalid. The human will to believe is inexhaustible. Okay, this guy I like to use, and a lot of atheists have come out, whenever I do a presentation, I try to see what people are saying. There's a guy on the internet now, he's an atheist called Paul Logia, uh, and so he's fairly recent, and he talks about, this guy's name is Anthony Flew. Anthony Flew was the go-to atheist for most of the 20th century, at least the last 50 years of the 20th century. He actually debated C.S. Lewis. He actually did, or actually engaged with C.S. Lewis, I should say. He was one of the signers of the uh, Humanist Manifesto, number three, okay? Um, he basically wrote Atheistic Humanism. It's a book of his. It's also an ideology that he basically said, when you're arguing with people coming from a standpoint of religion, always maintain the idea that the default position is atheism, meaning everybody else had to prove their point, but atheism didn't, okay? So made it, basically made everybody else do the work um, and no one else. But in 2003 or 2004, he wrote a book, There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. Now, he had a ghostwriter that wrote with him. He is an older gentleman. He is no longer, he taught at Oxford, Cambridge. He was at Reading, he was at Toronto. He was all over the place. He was a brilliant scholar. And so a lot of people say, and they will come up, well, he was mentally incompetent. He was not able to, the ideas were not his. The sad thing is, is I went and I read, I think it was five different reviews. I read a New York Times article from 2004 that basically they didn't attack his arguments once. They didn't look at the proof he offered for why he changed. All they did is they threw attacks at him personally. He was senile. He didn't know what he was talking about. Christians were taking advantage of him. Um, why don't you just, whether he's nuts or not, doesn't matter. If a guy who thinks he's Napoleon says two plus two equals four, he's still right. He may be nuts, but he's still right. So you attack the ideas, but everything I read was attacking the person. What does that make you think? Maybe they couldn't attack. But he said, my discovery of the divine has been a pilgrimage of reason and not of faith. He basically took the evidence from DNA and the fine tuning of the universe, finally said, it can't happen by chance. It's an impossibility, okay? So the, one of the same guys, Paul Logia, this atheist, also said, if I was going to come up with a convert, I would come up with a scientist, but they don't have any. And oh, I just thought, oh, I should text him, right? Not text him, but email him. This gentleman, John Sanford, he was at Cornell, okay? Published over 70 scientific. He actually is the inventor of what is called the uh, gene gun process. He also helped with uh, virus vaccination process. Brilliant man. I think he has some kind, 50 some inventions to his name. He was an atheist that became a old earth creationist that became a young earth creationist because of the scientific evidence. He's a geneticist. Okay? He wrote a book called Genetic Entropy and the Mystery of the Genome. And he said the main premises of evolution, natural selection, and mutation have proven to be false. They cannot create what they're supposed to create. It's an impossibility. And actually, he works with other people, what are called population geneticists, who work with the equations of figuring out, really, they said the human species should be extinct thousands of times over, because we're actually going towards extinction. We actually are giving so many mutations to our offspring that even with genetic engineering, we can't overcome them. We are going extinct, okay? And we should have hundreds of times over if evolution was true. 
Okay, so here is a scientist, and there are other brilliant people. One thing I want to do, this is Blaise Pascal, probability theory, wrote a great thing called Pensies, which were thoughts. But he basically had his conversion actually pinned to the inside of his coat, which is now uh, at Westminster, Westminster Abbey. C.S. Lewis, Malcolm Muggeridge, uh, some of these guys, Mortimer Adler, considered one of the most well-informed, well-read person. He edited the uh, 100 classics of the Western world. Okay, brilliant scholar, came to Christ late in life. Uh, most people don't know that Isaac Newton, even though his thoughts were a little off, uh, he actually wrote more about interpretation of the Bible than he did about science. Most people don't know that. Copernicus was going to be a priest. Okay, Raymond Damadian, Dr. Raymond Damadian, whenever people try to tell me that uh, creationists can't be good scientists, I usually bring him up. He is the inventor of the MRI, and he's a young earth creationist. Okay, now, just because someone converts, this is almost like the argument you heard me saying against Anthony Flew. You don't look at that they converted. You have people converting back and forth for a number of reasons. Maybe it's intellectual, emotional, whatever may be the case. You need to look at the reasons why they believe something. Okay, I love Kepler, when we think of planetary motion, he said the chief aim of all investigations of the external world should be to discover the rational order which has been imposed on it by God by which he revealed to us in the language of mathematics. And when you think about things, even mathematics are abstract. They're not concrete. Two plus two equals four. Yeah, you can have two objects, but it is immaterial. You know, it's interesting because Seattle Public Schools, and this was in October of last year, are going to start teaching that math is oppressive, okay? So basically, math is deeply frustrating for a lot of people, okay? Seattle Public school, Schools are gearing up to accuse math of a litany of more serious crimes, imperialism, dehumanization, and the oppression of marginalized people. When we start cutting us off from reality, we get some really wacky things going on. We see basically, I call it a cut flower society. You have flowers, if you cut them off, they look great for a limited time, but they're gonna die because obviously they're removed from their source. As we deny reality as it is, and we try to come up with a composite reality that is not true, we get some pretty wacky things. And I think that's the way that our world is moving at this time. One of the greatest uh, experimental scientists, uh, Faraday, he basically said, this was at his deathbed, he said, speculations, man, I have none. Okay, and that's unfounded reasoning, not based on evidence. I have certainties. I thank God that I do not rest my dying head upon speculations, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. So basically, I got to the point where I knew that what I believed was true to reality, that the Christian faith was true. But why Christianity? Most people, because they think Christianity is blind faith, test everything, hold fast to what is good. A biblical faith is actually a reasoning faith. It's an evidential faith in a lot of ways. We won't get into all the details of justification, things of that nature, but just the idea. And so this is in your notes. We're going to go really quick. But considering two or more closely competing explanations for an event, you can assess following a method called abductive reasoning. Actually, in my classes, I teach nine tests of a worldview, um, which is a separate type. But this is more of a, a general reasoning that we all do. So if you look at a cold case homicide detective, truth must be feasible. The alibis. Can the person have committed the crime? Can the worldview account for the world as we know it? Is it straightforward? You know, when we do our talks on like flood geology, one global flood will account for all of the different geologic features that we see, where when it comes to evolutionary paradigms, there are multiple and multiple factors that have to be involved at the right time, okay? Um, truth should be exhaustive. Let me give you this as an example. How many of the facts does it cover? Okay, if we have a certain number of facts, if we have 95 facts or if we have 95 things that a trial is considering and we have one suspect that accounts for 90 of those facts and we have another suspect that accounts for 20, which one exhausts the evidence? Obviously, the criminal that takes 90. Think about this. 
How then do we best account for the existence of valuable, morally responsible, self-aware, reasoning, truth-seeking, living human beings to inhabit a finely tuned, beautiful universe that came to exist a finite time ago? Is it best explained naturalistically, namely the result of disparate, valueless, mindless, lifeless, physical processes and a universe that came into existence from nothing? Or is it best explained by a unifying explanation, a supremely valuable, supremely aware, logical, truthful, powerful, intelligent, beautiful being? This being serves as a natural unifier and thus the superior explanation and grounding to the naturalistic alternative. Okay, you guys. When it comes to cause and effect relationships, the effect has to have attributes of the cause. How do we get personality from rocks? How do we get personality? How do we get consciousness from atoms just flying around? Okay. When we go back, truth must be logical. If you cannot account for reason, I think it's a, it's a fatal flaw for your worldview. Because if you cannot account for reason, how do you argue anybody to be persuasive in a certain way? You have to use reason. But if you cannot come up with why reason is even valid or what it is, your worldview collapses and eventually the truth will be superior, okay? When we find these, these are comparative tactics that we use and that's why I am a Christian. We run trips, um, we're not afraid to display our faith. We go to Berkeley, we go to uh, Southern California as well. And we do trips where we actually engage with people of different worldview in a civil way. Um, so we love questions, we love discussions, okay? And we like to make people think. And don't be, uh, there are atheists out there doing this as well, okay? Um, last couple of things, I wanted to clear up any, um, any misunderstandings. A lot of people when I talk think that all people should be happy if they believe in Jesus and everybody's sad if they're atheist. And that's not the way it works. We're complex. Sometimes we don't think through things. Maybe there's physical ramifications. And just to let you know, um, I, from time to time, have to go on medication because of my depression, because of the disparity that I feel. I think I really screwed up my body and my mind when it came to a lot of my drug use. I was prone to it anyways. So no, but I know that my faith is true because it's true to reality. It can be tested. Every now and then, yeah, do I get warm fuzzies when I'm worshiping or things of that nature? Yeah, I do sometimes, but it's not a prominent feeling for me. My faith is derived from knowing in whom I believed and that it's true to reality. I test it and I constantly test it. I actually read more atheist books, more evolutionary books than I do Christian books, okay? We're not gonna go through the challenge but if you are a Christian, okay, poke around a little bit, ask some questions, look at maybe some atheist sites and find out what they're saying about your faith. Because if it's true to reality, it'll stand up. You can prod and poke, okay? But make sure also that you're willing to do the footwork to find the answers. I always tell people that I work with, intellectually, if you leave the Christian faith, it's because either you don't want it to be true or you're too lazy to do the footwork to find out. It's not because the answers aren't there, okay? If you're a Bible open person, maybe you've come to Christianity before, but it's either turned you away because of pains or things like that. Are you willing to look at it a second time? And then actually for the Bible closed person, and I don't know if there's anybody in here that would fit that, you know, all I want you to be is open-minded. I'm not asking you to believe that it's the word of God. I'm asking you to read it and actually give it the due diligence that you should, especially the influence it's had. Uh, is it true to reality? Those are the things you have to test, okay? Truth, what is it? Truth matters eternally, kind of like gravity. If Christianity is true to reality as it truly is, what do you do with the actual guilt and anxiety you have? Christianity is the only worldview where the creator of all things has solved the problem for you and then asks you to trust him and to enter into his joy, okay? If it's not true to reality, it's not worthy of anything. C.S. Lewis said, he said, Christianity cannot be neutral. It's either of infinite value or it's of no value because if it's telling you lies about the world, you shouldn't trust it. But if it is true, it doesn't matter if you believe it or not 
those are the consequences. This is what is true to reality. And we're going to skip this really quick. It's a great quote from Luther. Um, he basically talks about how really Christianity is the only thing that can ease a conscience that is overridden with guilt. We have actual guilt and we all feel it or fear or anxiety. And he has solved that through what he's done. It is a teaching that is given only by God. It does not proceed from free will, nor was it invented by human reason or wisdom. Okay. Thank you guys for your patience. Uh, why don't we, are there any...